spiritual gifts is speaking in tongues. And over your pastoral ministry at Bethlehem, you've encouraged your people to pursue the full range of the spiritual gifts. What do you mean by speaking in tongues? And how have they operated or not operated during your pastorate? If you don't talk about them from the pulpit and teach on them, at least in our context, they tend to fade into the background. And so we go through seasons. And I would say the prominent seasons have been where they're just not in the forefront. The, that is the extraordinary gifts like tongues. And I'm okay with that uh, since my sense is that Paul was not eager to forefront that gift, but was a little bit miffed that it was being foregrounded as much as it was when he wrote 1 Corinthians 12. He, he was having to give restraint to it rather than promote it. He said, I'd rather speak 5,000 or 10,000 words with my mouth and with my mind than, than, than uh, five words with my mind than 10,000 with the tongue. And so that seemed to indicate, okay, don't fret too much if it's not a prominent experience. So I, I don't buy, of course, the Pentecostal historical teaching that you must speak in tongues in order to signify that you're filled with the Spirit or, with, with, or that you're a Christian even. So the, the function that, that it has is that it's a gift. It's there. I see no reason for arguing that anything has changed in the history of redemption that between the age of the apostles and our age, that gift should have disappeared. Uh, if God wants it to disappear, he'll make it disappear. I see at least two kinds of expressions of it. One would be where it is an actual language. And I've heard stories that people, without knowing what they're doing, have spoken a language that somebody from another people group understood. And so that would be one view. And then my sense is from reading 1 Corinthians 12 that that's not what was going on there, but that it was more of an ecstatic utterance that didn't have any ordinary human meaning, but tongues of men and of angels, tongues of angels seems to be spoken about. And so it's a kind of utterance where your heart is full to the point of overflowing with the Holy Spirit. He looses your tongue to, to utter those syllables and they are of spiritual value to you. And if there is someone with an interpretation, then they become spiritually valuable to others. Which is why Paul instructs that if that person interpreting isn't there, there is no one, then don't do it in public. And I think that's why, basically, they don't have the prominency in public. So I would encourage in a church that if people believe that they have these gifts, they would function in the smaller groupings of the church where people who uh, have gifts of interpretation can be there. I think the typical use of them to just speak them out in public as a kind of corporate ecstasy, I don't find warrant for that in the, in the New Testament. In fact, I think Paul is trying to discourage that because he says people will come in and they'll say, you're crazy. Uh, but if everybody's prophesying, if they're speaking the word of God, if they're one by one speaking out of what God has shown them in the word or from experience, then the person might fall down and say, God is in this, in this place. As far as my own experience goes, I don't believe that I have ever authentically spoken in tongues. And I remember in the seasons, you know, it's funny that you're asking me this today. We're in December. Just this morning, I was pacing in my living room, memorizing some words from uh, Jude 120 to 22. Um, and for some reason, it says, um, keep yourselves in the love of God, surrounded by three participles, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, which gives you eternal life. And so those three participles define how you keep yourself in the love of God. And for some reason, there came to my mind, because I don't think praying in the Holy Spirit means praying in tongues. That's probably why it came to my mind. I think it means being in sync with the Holy Spirit in the way you pray. 
But I thought of tongues. I said, I haven't asked for tongues for a long time. And so I just paused. I'm, I'm walking back and forth in my living room. Nobody, Tal is up in her room. Noel's at the gym. And I said, Lord, I'm still eager to speak in tongues. Would you give me that gift? Now, at that point, you can try to say banana backwards if you want to. <laughs> I used to sit in the car outside church singing in tongues. But I knew I wasn't. I was just making it up. And I said, this isn't it. I know this isn't it. But this is what they try to get you to do if, if you're in that certain group. And I, I just, I did everything to try to open myself to this. And, and the Lord has always said to me without words, no. <laughs> no. But, but he never just said no. He always said, John Piper, I have given you a gift. I have given you the gift of teaching, of preaching, of shepherding. You shepherd the prophets. You shepherd the tongue speakers. I'm not going to give it to you. But I don't assume that's his last word. And so every now and then, I'm just going to go back to him like a child and say, a lot of my brothers and sisters have this gift. Can I have it too? And if he says no, because it might go to your head or because you'd misuse it or because or whatever, it's his business. So um, I, I don't think tongues is a prominent or primary gift. It tends to become that because it's so strange and so rare and so unusual. But I don't think in the New Testament it is normative. In fact, at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, it says, Do all speak in tongues? Do all prophesy? Do all have uh, work miracles? No, they don't all. And so I don't feel guilt for not having it. I feel like I'm submitting to my Father in heaven.